This is my 2011 Range Rover that I purchased at a Copart auction with mechanical damage. You see where it says enhanced vehicles? That's code for the vehicle doesn't run. You see, these 5 liter Jaguar V8s are notorious for having timing issues which can lead to catastrophic engine failure. My name is Waldo and previously in this series I got the engine running but I detected the telltale sound of an engine that's suffering from serious timing issues. I'm determined to fix this issue, though it's not going to be easy. The factory service manual says this is a 12.2 hour job requiring quite a few special tools. I've ordered all the parts, including revised parts, to fix the timing issue permanently. Now luckily when it comes to mechanics, I'm YouTube certified, so hopefully there shouldn't be any issues there. As for special tools, one of my viewers, Joe, was nice enough to lend me his set of tools. The set goes for about $1,000, so I am incredibly grateful. Let's start by getting the budget Range Rover into the budget shop. Well, this work isn't going to do itself, so let's get to it. The first thing I really need to do is just remove a bunch of stuff to gain access. I'm at the first point where I need to stop and use a special tool, this slide hammer here, in order to get the fuel injectors out. Now, I've heard that these can be pretty difficult to remove, so that's why I opted to do this first while the engine is still warm. My thought process is that while the cylinder head is hot, the holes are larger, and then these should come out easily, and look at the results. One of the fuel injectors actually came out with the fuel rail, and it also happens to be the one all the way in the back there that's the hardest to get to, so that's a win. So how this works is I stick this collet over the fuel injector, lock it, and then I can pull it out with the slide hammer. Look at that. Great success. All right, I got all eight injectors out. And I did end up having to remove the cabin air intake that goes right around here in order to get access to the back injectors. All right, so next I need to drain the radiator in order to remove it and a bunch of other stuff on the front here to make room. And this is pretty much guaranteed to make a huge mess. Oh no, take a look at this. See all those copper flakes at the bottom of this? That's really bad news. So I did a little bit of research to confirm my suspicions, and I found that there are a number of radiator coolant stop leak products that contain copper colored flakes like what we found in the coolant over there. Those stop leak products are also advertised as solving head gasket issues, and that really makes me wonder if that's what we're dealing with here. Now this brings me back to part one of the video series where we found the half empty bottles of coolant in the boot. And well, I also found the business card of the previous owner and called him up. And when I asked him about those, he told me that those were from when he had the water pump replaced, I believe. And he never mentioned anything about the vehicle overheating or having a head gasket issue. I assumed that he was just using them to top it off because maybe the water pump was leaking. But I wonder now if maybe the water pump was leaking so much that the coolant ran out in the vehicle or got very low and overheated, causing a head gasket issue. Now there is one other piece of evidence support a possible head gasket issue and that is there is a lot of water vapor coming from the exhaust when the engine is running. Now I was kind of hoping that this is normal or maybe it would go away or something like that but it's kind of the elephant in the room at this point and I don't think I can ignore it any longer. On the other hand, we tested the compression and the compression results were pretty decent, so if there is a head gasket leak, at least it's not very bad. The problem is, with the plans that I'm considering for this vehicle, even a small coolant leak is unacceptable. I'm kind of thinking at this point my best bet is to pull the cylinder heads off so that I can take a look at the head gasket. I can also measure the heads and the block mating surface for flatness to see if it's warped at all from overheating. It certainly would be interesting to see a bunch of that copper colored gunk sealing up part of the head gasket which would tell me immediately that's what the problem is. As for the amount of extra work that it would be to pull the cylinder heads off at this point, I don't think it would be that bad because I need to do most of the work that it would take anyway to access the timing components. 
This project has been a little bit of a roller coaster ride so far, with this part definitely being a negative downturn, but I am not giving up. Other YouTubers have tried to get cheap Range Rovers before and failed, and I certainly don't want to add myself to that list. While I have this thing up on the lift, I removed the starter, and that brings us to special tool number two. This thing's job is to hold the flywheel in place while I remove the crankshaft pulley when I get to that part. With the tool bolted in place, the repair manual says to inspect it to make sure the tool is correctly locked in between the flywheel teeth. Who to thunk a lighted inspection mirror would come in so handy? I'll go ahead and put a link in the description. Now I can lower the vehicle and start removing parts at the front of the engine. All right, special tool number three. This thing bolts onto the crankshaft pulley and holds it in place while you use this special socket, which fits in the middle, to loosen up the crankshaft pulley bolt, which is very tight. So I'm loosening these bolts on the crankshaft pulley, and look what I just noticed. There's a hole in the timing cover. I don't think that is supposed to be there. Now I'm really interested to take a look inside to see what's going on. I guess that explains all of the oil that is soaking the front of this engine. It kind of looked like it was coming from the oil filter housing, so I assumed that maybe someone did an oil change and didn't put it back on right, but it might be coming from that hole. Anyway, I have the tool installed here, and I have this end of it held up by a 2x6. That's going to keep this thing from turning. I'm going to use a big three-quarter inch drive ratchet for this part, and a pipe. Notice I'm turning this clockwise. That's because this is a left-hand thread bolt. Special tool number four, this screws in where the crankshaft pulley bolt was, and then this part screws to the pulley itself, and then as I tighten this up, it pulls the pulley right off. So let's take a look in here and look at this. The very first thing I see, that, I mean, that looks like it's probably a piece of the tensioner guide. Well, that's no bueno. Take a look at this. It looks like the timing chain guide bolt broke off and then moved around in the tensioner wallowing out this hole and also wearing a hole in the timing cover. At some point the bolt probably hit the crankshaft pulley causing it to break the timing chain guide. This would have caused oil to leak out of the engine, eventually causing the knocking noise that we initially heard. As for the timing chain noise, the broken guide definitely could be a factor, but I also noticed that the tensioners are the old design, so this engine may never have had the timing fixed. Once we get the tensioner guides off, we'll be able to tell for sure by inspecting them. In order to do that, I first have to remove the valve covers, followed by the upper timing covers. First thing we do is take out these tensioners, so you can see what they look like. Definitely the old style tensioner. It still does have some spring pressure there, which is good. It is of course hydraulically controlled to give it its full pressure, but it seems like it's still in decent shape. Well, this one seemed fine until I pressed in too many times and now it's stuck, so I'm not sure if this one is okay. I don't know. Either way, of course I'm replacing these. And now for the part I'm really excited about. Tensioner. 
Oh yeah. That is definitely the old design of tensioner, and it is very worn out. I think it's very likely that this is the issue, or at least one of the issues. If we compare the old and new guides, you can see that the old design has a soft aluminum surface where it's contacted by the tensioner. Over time, it wears out, causing reduced chain tension. The revised design has a hardened contact point to eliminate this issue. Alright, so take a look at this guide here. One bolt, two bolt, three bolts. Now let's take a look at the broken guide. So there's a bolt right there. There's supposed to be a bolt right there in the middle, and then the last one is supposed to be right there as well. And look, look at how much this thing moves around, how loose it is. That is absolutely crazy. No wonder this thing was having issues. The one on the other side, it's a little bit loose, but not too bad. Yeah, so this middle bolt here must have come loose and fallen down there. That could have been absolutely catastrophic if that fell into some moving parts, so I guess this is really lucky that it didn't. I wonder if it's at the bottom of the oil pan right now. Ah, okay, we can actually see that that bolt broke off as well. Well, that is really weird, but once again, inspection mirror for the win. Oh, there it is down there. Can you see that? So this thing obviously has some serious timing issues, and I could reassemble it right now with the new timing components that I bought, and it should fix the timing permanently. However, don't forget that I suspect this thing also has some head gasket issues. So the next steps would be to remove the cylinder heads so that I can replace the head gaskets, and of course, inspect the cylinder heads themselves to make sure they haven't warped from overheating. Now, removing the cylinder heads is certainly doable with the engine in the vehicle itself. However, it is easier to do with the engine out of the vehicle. And that brings me to the next point, which is I'm sort of considering doing a full engine rebuild. With all of the time and effort that I'm putting into this and considering how stripped down the engine is going to be, how much work would it really be at this point to do a rebuild? Don't forget that we discovered in part one that there is cylinder scoring on the left bank of cylinders, and eventually that is going to turn into piston slap, at which point the engine is going to need to be rebuilt or replaced. Now I don't know how long it'll take before it gets to that point, but it's probably somewhere in the tens of thousands of miles. I know I had said in part one that I did not want to do a rebuild on this, but here I am at the end of part three, and I'm thinking about doing an engine rebuild. What I would do is have the cylinder cylinders bored out and honed, throw some oversized pistons and rings in there, throw some new bearings in there while I'm at it, and the result would be an engine that is basically brand new and should last 150, 200,000 miles. Wouldn't it be pretty cool to have perhaps the first Range Rover ever to hit 300,000, maybe 350,000 miles? In any case, let me know what you guys think about this. Should I rebuild the engine? Should I just pull the heads off and replace the head gaskets? Also, let me know down in the comments if you know where I can get any oversized pistons because I've done a little bit of searching and I haven't found anything yet. If I do decide to rebuild the engine, at least I will end up with a really nice car considering how good the physical condition of the body and the interior is. Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you in part four. Aspen up, good girl. Aspen off, good girl.